Holy Spirit, as told in Luke 3, 15 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when John, Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God spoken for all people. Thanks be to God. So now we're in what's called the season after Epiphany. <laughs> and Epiphany is the story that we normally associate with the wise men who come to see Jesus from the East. But it might help to remember that that's not really the only Epiphany that happens in this season. Remember that story is just the first of actually three. The second one we'll talk about today, the baptism of Jesus. And the third is Jesus' transfiguration. And that will lead us into Lent. And all of these events are ways for people to witness that Jesus is God's Son. And all are markedly different from one another. That first one, witnessed by wise men from the East, opened up the possibility, the reality, really, that Jesus was there for more than just those immediately surrounding him. Today's event is witnessed by those who are gathered on a particular day to be baptized with Jesus by John. And the transfiguration will be witnessed by just three of the disciples. Interesting. And we may talk about that more later, but for today, let's look at the baptism of Jesus. As epiphanies go, it's interesting to note that in Luke's version, Jesus' baptism is barely mentioned. It's a, we hear John the baptizer course correcting people about who is and who is not the Messiah to all of those who happen to be gathered that day at the Jordan, and we don't know who they are. And the next thing we know, the baptism had already taken place. No show, no fanfare, no special stuff, no details. We don't know if he was sprinkled or immersed. I'm going to guess immersion. What words might have been used, what vows were made, or whether it was some official scroll or stone or something that documented the event. All we do know is that Luke tells us that in the group that day, Jesus had also been baptized. Nothing more. If this oh-so-brief recording of the event is any indication, then perhaps the methodology isn't important. But if that's the case, what is? And why was Jesus there to be baptized in the first place? John was teaching repentance forgiveness of sin, and here comes Jesus who is without sin. So, what's up exactly? And what might we make of this? I wonder. I wonder if John went to be baptized because he was entering into the same messy world that all of the people surrounding him were living. He came to be God. He was and is God with us. So imagine him entering the river with people who needed and sought forgiveness of sins in a way that allowed him to take that in as part of his baptism and then rise up to God and shoulder that burden all the way to the cross. Just a possibility to think about. It's notable that if that's the case, and regardless, his actions 
were such that he embraced all that was less than in the South by walking into the river. But there weren't any words that were offered to explain why he would do that or to help us understand. There was just silence. Perhaps so he could experience what happens for us when we have no words in the face of things that overwhelm us. Perhaps something else. And perhaps to then experience with those around him the words that were spoken afterwards from God. The words that simply said, I love you in their own way. It's interesting to note, too, that only Luke and Mark incorporate the word you in this particular example of that, our story of baptism. In Mark's version, this blessing is spoken only to Jesus. Mark 3, verses 13 through 17 tell us that when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, Suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. But in Luke, all those present see and hear God's message. Now when the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form. And a voice came from heaven, saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. But this time, these words from heaven not only echoed God's words from Isaiah about not being fruitful, about being redeemed and called by name, they were also heard by everyone there. We don't know who the everyone is. But it's a fair guess based on previous scripture stories, that the people who went to John weren't necessarily from palaces and high-end professions. They were people who were seeking something more than they had. Quite likely, he was surrounded by what well, we would turn today as the other in whatever context that would be. And the witness you to Jesus reflects the you that God is saying to all of them through his love made incarnate in Jesus. A powerful epiphany, if you will, in this season after epiphany, that people there would feel included in God's love, experience that day with Jesus, a love that echoed the epiphany of the Magi. Huh. Lutheran pastor Carolyn Lewis, a working preacher, uh, shares the story of being a guest preacher in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And during her one of the services there, a family of five came up to be baptized. When the pastor she was assisting said to the mother of that family, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. There was no mistaking or mishearing or misinterpreting the you. And tears streamed down her face. This older believer who had never imagined that God could truly love her. This is the you Luke speaks of. This is the you God calls us to. So I was going to tell you a little bit more about the United Methodist lit litany of baptism. But instead I'd like to share another story. Because there's a piece of this that gets, can get lost in all of the preparation and things that we do to make sure we're ready for baptism and not to make light of that. But we can get so caught up in the doing of it that we miss the blessing of it, the beloved unless we really catch it, like the woman in the story I just shared. So as those of you, for those of you who have been listening to me for a while, you know that I did a chaplain residency, and prior to that I did an internship as a chaplain at St. Joe's Hospital in Tacoma. And as chaplain interns, we were on call to anywhere in the hospital uh, where there was a need for a chaplain, and you never knew what would come your way. It was a Catholic-based hospital, so there were certain guidelines if certain calls came up, and one of those was for stillborns. 
I came in on shift, and 20 minutes after all of those who would have been able to guide me more had gone home for the day, we got a call. A 19-week-old baby boy was stillborn, and they wanted a chaplain. The family was Hispanic, and they, in the immediate family, they were, there were five. Uh, and I was called to go up and be with them. And what I remembered about the guidance was, if they ask you to baptize this baby, you cannot, because that is in conflict, as I understand it, with the Catholic belief. But you can bless the baby. So I went to the room, and not only were there the five people who were uh, the immediate family, mom, dad, uh, brother, and two sisters, and they're, this is a late in life baby, and they're all, they were all over the moon, and now they're devastated. Mom doesn't really know what's happened yet. There are also another 10 people in the room, all members of family, that are there to support them. And I come in as the chaplain. And the father comes towards me, and he has in his hands a washcloth wrapped like this. And this perfectly warm 19 week old boy is inside. And in that moment, I am their representative of God in this space. I've never been in that situation before, nor have I been since. And I praise God for stepping in. Because when he offered the baby to me, the mom and me just scooped him right up. And I stood like this, rocking back and forth. We don't understand one another's work. But we understand one another's actions. There was no ask. I saw his tear and cried with him. I made a sign as though praying so he would understand. And held this child, rules or no rules, and said, You are my beloved. With you I am loved. He sat on the floor holding the baby. I offered him back to his father and he accepted him and we sat quietly until the priest that was in the parish for their family came and could speak to them directly. Baptism is a sacrament in the United Methodist Church. It is one of two, communion is the other. And we have lots of rules and lots of liturgy and lots of things that surround those two sacraments, all a part of our story and history as this denomination has grown into their connection with Christ. But inside both of those things, and certainly baptism, is the connection that we hold in blessing. Whether baptized or not, we can all know that we are called and loved and blessed by God from our creation to our passing. The details of all of this aren't important. What's important is that knowingness. You are called. You are blessed.